Piers Morgan. He's known by some as one of the last bastions of free speech, a man that stands bold in the face of wokeism and really just tells it how it is. To others, he's just a bit of a prick, really. An outrage merchant, no different to Tucker Carlson or Milo Yiannopoulos. But where did his career start, I hear you ask? And why was he cast as the Great Goblin under the Misty Mountains when we still have a perfectly serviceable Anne Widdicombe? Today, we're going to take a look at the so-called man called Piers Morgan, if that's his real name. It is. And after a totally objective rundown of his life and times, you can decide for yourself if he's a free speech champion or just a sad old grifter clinging to relevance by gargling the penile ejaculate of Rupert Murdoch. Piers was born slash summoned in Surrey in 1965, and he proved from an early age that he was destined to be a tabloid journalist. I know what you're thinking, and no, it's not because he was born without a spine, although he definitely was. It was because he would spend his spare time reporting on his local village's cricket matches. Again, I know what you're thinking. What a complete fucking virgin. And yeah, that's fair enough. He finished his education by studying journalism at Harlow College, then joined the Surrey and South London newspaper group in 1985. After a few years as a freelancer, he was recruited by The Sun's former editor, Calvin McKenzie, to work on a showbiz column in The Sun called Bizarre. Now, for the sake of context, and honestly because I think he's a total prick, Calvin McKenzie is responsible for some of The Sun's most ridiculous and inflammatory pieces, including accusing Elton John of having sex with underage boys, which he provided absolutely zero evidence for, and even accusing him of having his guard dog's vocal cords removed because he couldn't sleep. This was all, obviously, complete bollocks to any person with more than two brain cells, and Elton John was awarded one million pounds in damages after he won a libel case. You may also remember Kelvin as The Sun's editor during the Hillsborough disaster, the reporting of which was described by The Sun itself as the most terrible mistake in its history. He's, how do you say it, a bastard man, a twat, an asshole, if you will. Now, I know this isn't about Kevin, but I think it's important to recognise that the first person to see potential in Piers was also the man responsible for some of the most disgusting and outrageously false stories to ever appear in a British newspaper. While Piers covered showbiz, he was never particularly interested in what he was reporting. He instead put considerable effort into befriending stars and being pictured with high-profile celebrities. He himself described it as egomaniacal and shameless, admitting that most people he was pictured with had no idea who he was. By 1994, Rupert Murdoch had caught wind of the fact that he had a self-centred, morally bankrupt showbiz journalist with a reputation for pushing against the boundaries of journalistic ethics. He decided to reward his, let's call it, tenacity by making him the editor of the News of the World. Over the next year, Piers was on fire. In the metaphorical sense, sorry to get your hopes up. The news of the world made quite a name for itself for breaking news stories and uncovering truths that may or may not in hindsight have been accrued in a less than legal manner. Piers was quick to credit a highly efficient news desk and the publicist Max Clifford, a man who probably wasn't even arrested in 2012 for sexually assaulting four girls between the ages of 15 and 19, don't look that up. This success would come to a screeching halt in 1995, when Piers Bloody Morgan decided to publish images of Princess Diana's stepsister, Catherine Lockwood, leaving an addictive disorders clinic. He then decided to quit his role totally of his own accord and probably without prompt. Now, we can all agree that that's just a scummy thing to do to anybody, but the really important thing to remember here is that Piers found it entirely appropriate to expose the private lives of the royal family for his own profit, because it really would be most hypocritical of him to harass another person for doing that very same thing. Foreshadowing is a literary device. Once Piers left the news of the world, he went to work as the editor of the Daily Mirror. While there, he didn't exactly distance himself from controversy. By February of 2000, he was put under investigation after he bought £67,000 worth of shares in Alan Sugar's tech company, Viglan. He bought those shares in the afternoon before the company was tipped to be a strong investment by The Daily Mirror, the very company he was an editor of at the time. Piers later stated that his buying of the stocks was nothing to do with the planned column. He was going to buy them anyway, so he says. 
I mean, sure, he was an editor of the paper at the time. And yeah, Alan Sugar was also a columnist at the Daily Mirror when the story ran, and it just so happens that the journalists that wrote the pieces were sacked and criminally charged, but I suppose it's just one of those happy coincidences. You know how it is. You're a casual investor and you get a good feeling about some stocks, it's only natural to chuck £20,000 at it, and then another £36,000 through a personal equity plan, then another £13,000 from a personal equity plan registered to your wife. Totally regular behaviour, and I'm sure his other investments show the same level of alacrity. In 2001, Piers was once again under fire as he, once again, published a story about another celebrity leaving an addictive disorders clinic. This time it was Naomi Campbell, and this time Naomi sued and won. Not only did this make Piers look like a complete cock, but it also showed that he was a sore loser and a pathetic little weasel with tiny balls when he reacted to the decision by saying that it was a good day for lying, drug-abusing prima donnas. The final nail in the coffin came in 2004, when Piers was fired after publishing images accusing British soldiers of torturing prisoners in Iraq. The images were fake, and this whole thing frankly made Piers look like a ripe bellend. While the Mirror was quick to issue an apology, Piers refused to admit that the images were fake. After the RMPs investigated, they showed that the vehicle in the video had never been used in Iraq, and while Private Stuart Mackenzie of the TA was implicated as the photographer, it was never proven. Rather than accepting the fact that he's a thick bellend, Piers maintains that the images could be real, making him a thick, dishonest bellend instead. Now, for most people, that would probably have been the end of their life in the public eye, but not for Piers Morgan. You remember earlier we talked about him spending his time at the Sun building relationships with celebrities and putting his name out there? Well, one person he befriended was an entrepreneur and man who would probably never have plastic surgery by the name of Simon Cowell. Oh my fucking god. As a result, he managed to secure a spot as a judge on America's Got Talent. Now, I'm not sure what's more ridiculous, the idea that America has talent or the fact that Piers is in a position to judge it, but the show was a huge success. It made the judges a household name, and Piers found a whole new platform to act like a complete twat on. And so began a television career spanning decades, presenting documentaries, award shows, interviews, news, and it even won the US version of The Celebrity Apprentice in 2008. Trump described Piers as ruthless, arrogant, evil, and obnoxious, which I can't help but feel was more of a compliment coming from him. Despite Piers being surprisingly level-headed when it came to Donald Trump, it turns out that he was saving all of his gammon-brained meltdowns for two others. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. With the way that Piers attacks them, you'd expect to find that they'd been shitting on his father's grave every Christmas or something. He'd relentlessly attacked both Meghan and Harry since they began dating, accusing Meghan of being a manipulative social climber who's destroying the royal family. Now, putting aside the fact that he's a complete cunt, what would cause him to so passionately attack the couple as he does? Well, it's a lot simpler than you'd think. She ghosted him, and his ego got bruised. Okay, fine, here's the abridged story, but it will be abridged because, let's face it, we've all got shit to do. As I understand it, Piers and Meghan began talking in 2015 when he started following her on Twitter. She was a fan of him, he was a fan of her, he liked suits, someone had to, I suppose, yada yada yada, it was all very cute. In Rolls 2016, and Meghan began casually seeing Prince Harry after a mutual friend set them up on a date. In June of 2016, Piers sat down with Meghan to interview her. They both have a jolly good time, and the news breaks a few months later that Harry and Meghan are dating. He was all praises for her. He even wrote in an article that she would be the perfect princess, and that she's got beauty, brains, charm, and a great sense of humour. 2017. Piers congratulates Meghan on the whole marriage thing, but apparently hasn't heard from her since she started seeing Harry. As far as I can tell, this is where it all seems to go tits up. Piers got ghosted, and like all egomaniacal stalkers, he felt that he was owed her attention. I would submit that not only is it her right to choose who she socialises with, obviously, but that it's also not terribly hard to understand why she wouldn't want to continue speaking to, of all people, Piers fucking Morgan. See, Prince Harry has a real bee in his bonnet about tabloid journalists since the whole they killed my mum thing, which honestly isn't that hard to empathise with. Now imagine you're Meghan. 
An American woman with presumably a minimal understanding of the last 50 years of royal life in England, and you tell your new boyfriend that you're mates with the former Sun journalist who would regularly involve himself in his mother's life in order to exploit her for headlines. Now you might think to yourself, oh, I didn't know that, I thought he was just a bloke from America's Got Talent. I think it's probably for the best that I let this extremely brief and inconsequential friendship fizzle out. After all, we've only met once and sent a couple of tweets, it's not like he's going to spend the next few years harassing me, right? Ever since then, Pierce has been on a mission to torpedo his own career by verbally abusing the very woman he was praising just a year previously. He heaped praises onto her when it suited him, when he thought he could get some headlines and exclusive interviews, and as soon as she stopped providing it, she went from being the perfect princess to a woman that was single-handedly destroying the British monarchy. In March of 2021, Piers stormed off the set of Good Morning Britain after one of his colleagues called him out on his bullshit. Take a look at this. And I understand that you don't like Meghan Markle. You've made it so clear a number of times on this programme, a number of times, and I understand that you've got a personal relationship with Meghan Markle or had one, and she cut you off. She's entitled to cut you off if she wants to. Has she said anything about you since she cut you off? I don't think she has, but yet you continue to trash her. OK. I'm done with this. No, no, no. Sorry. No. Oh, Sorry. Do you know what? That's pathetic. You can trash me, maybe not my no, own. No, 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 no. I'm, later. I'm being... Sorry, can't this do this. This is absolutely diabolical behaviour. You, he, I'm sorry, but Pierce spouts off on a regular basis, and we all have to sit there and listen. 6.30 to 7 o'clock yesterday was incredibly hard to watch. Don't you find it completely amazing how this fetid toad of a man rags on somebody for not being able to tolerate some criticism from the press, then storms off the set of his own show after he receives less than 60 seconds of criticism from the press. It might be no surprise to you at this point that Piers was fired from Good Morning Britain after commenting that he didn't believe Meghan's claims that she'd felt suicidal while she was part of the royal family. It's certainly very interesting that back in 2015, Piers shared an article of Meghan's in which she discusses the systemic racism she was exposed to from an early age, how it was embedded in our systems and culture, and how it affected her self-identity and mental health. Apparently, Piers is more than willing to empathise with Meghan's lived experiences with racism, and yet when she discusses it through the lens of our uber-traditionalist all-white monarchy, he somehow finds it incomprehensible. I personally don't find it all that hard to believe that the family of Prince Philip and Prince Andrew might not be the most culturally sensitive and progressive people in the world. This is the same family that, until as late as 1968, had banned the employment of non-white people into clerical positions in Buckingham Palace. Old Liz even used an archaic law called the Queen's Consent to amend legislation so that she was exempt from equality laws that prevent discrimination on the basis of race. This idea that the royal family is steeped in racism isn't just possible, it's certain. Now, his hatred of Harry, on the other hand, is nothing too complicated at all. But to cover that, we need to move on to our next topic, the phone hacking scandal. Last year, a High Court trial took place in which several claimants alleged that the Mirror Group hacked their voicemails in order to gather stories about them for publication. One of the claimants was none other than Prince Harry, and Piers Flipping Morgan just happened to be the editor of the Mirror at the time that this scandal took place. Now, long story short, after a seven-week trial, the judge ruled in December 2023 that the higher-ups at the Mirror Group must have known about the phone hacking and failed to put a stop to it. Piers Morgan included. Indeed, evidence was heard that Piers would urge phone company executives to encourage customers to change their PIN, because journalists could listen to their voicemail messages. Witnesses at the paper say Morgan was told explicitly that their stories were known to be accurate because they came from the victim's voicemails. Even back in 2012, during the testimonies at the Leveson inquiry, Jeremy Paxman said that Piers told him how phone hacking is done. As more and more witnesses took to the stand to recount their experiences, the Mirror Group presented no evidence to contradict their testimonies, and so the judge ruled in favour of Harry and the gang. 
Just to give you an idea of the scope of the evidence highlighted, Harry alone provided 140 stories that he claims contained information that was illegally acquired. In response to the ruling, Piers took to his front doorstep to state categorically that he had no involvement in or knowledge of any form of phone hacking during his time as an editor. So, to be clear, if you believe Piers, you honestly believe that he was totally unaware that the Mirror was publishing a puff piece on stocks he purchased just hours before they were published. If you believe Piers, you believe that in the decade that he was an editor at the News of the World and the Mirror, he had absolutely no idea that every prick in a 10 mile radius of fucking Fleet Street had been hacking phones to fill column inches. I'm just struggling to decide what kind of man Piers Morgan is. Is he the intelligent, scrupulous, no-nonsense journalist he portrays himself to be in the media? Or is he the whimpering, meek, brain-dead moron he portrays himself to be in the courts? So what's Piers doing with himself nowadays? Well, if he's not teaching pigeons to attack bandits in Central Park, you can find him hosting Piers Morgan Uncensored, available to watch on the Murdoch-owned Talk TV. It's basically exactly what you imagine it is, Piers screaming about how pronouns are turning the frogs gay and discussing the Israel-Palestine conflict with such renowned experts as Dr. Jordan Eat Medicine. Because if there's anybody that can navigate the intricacies and politics of the 75-year-long conflict, it's the man that doesn't understand what the word what means. So look, we've been through a lot in this video. Now it's up to you to make your own decision as to what kind of man you think he is. Is Piers Morgan an exceptional journalist with an eye for detail? Or is he the Officer Doofy of British tabloid journalism? I personally can't help but think he's just a nasty little fibber. A liar liar pants on fire. A fabricator. A spinner of yarns. You get it. You get it. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please do like and subscribe, it really helps. A huge thank you to my voluptuous and enigmatic patrons. If you'd like to support, you can do so from just £1 a month. The link is in the description. Love you. Bye bye.